Welcome to Cornell Keynotes. I'm your host, Chris Wofford, and I'm joined by our friend Tom Scriver from Cornell's Center for Regional Economic Advancement to talk about business ideas, or rather how to ask the right questions, like what makes a great business idea? Is it even viable? How do I validate my business thesis before going to market? Or how do I raise capital or pitch investors? Lots to consider. So if your entrepreneurial instincts are firing and you want to know where to go with your great business idea, today's episode with Tom should get you moving in the right direction. Be sure to check the episode notes for some of the links and next steps we mentioned in today's conversation. So thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Tom, welcome to the Keynotes Podcast. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. All right. What makes a good business idea? The way we think about it is we have a kind of rubric that we use, like a number of factors. So what I would look for is something that is really great on several factors, things like a really big market, things like a really compelling value proposition. That is to say, people who have a deep need. We talk about hair on fire problems and you've got the bucket of water, right? And they desperately need your solution. Things like sustainable competitive advantage, something that you can do that other people are going to have a hard time replicating. Things like low capital requirements, so you don't need a lot of resources to get started up front. And a really important one is what we call team market fit, some kind of connection between the individual entrepreneur and the space that they're in. The the reality is no business idea is perfect on all of those things, right? I mean, Walmart is a very successful business. And it's used at scale to have great competitive advantage. It's huge, but it took a lot of money to build all those stores, right? So you can't really get all of those things at once, but those are the factors that we encourage people to evaluate and say, where are you really strong? And there better be a couple of those factors that you're strong on to make a business idea worth pursuing. So where do business ideas come from? I mean, where should we look to find them? There's two ways that people find business ideas. One is they've got a product or service in mind, or maybe they have a technology, right? And they're thinking about the product or service that you could create from that technology. We see that all the time at Cornell with researchers, right? Folks like PhD engineers and such. Oh, I invented this great thing. What do I do with it? I invented Flubber, right? What do I do with Flubber? And so we often talk about that as being a hammer looking for a nail, right? And so that's one way to go. The other way to go is to say, oh, I see this need. Hey, there's these people who seem really dissatisfied with this thing that's out there. Or maybe I myself am really dissatisfied with the offerings in a particular area. One of the things that I find really inspiring is when you look at people, particularly in a business context, and you see them doing something that they've created themselves that looks really cumbersome, like they've created this really complicated like spreadsheet or clipboard system or whatever. And you're like, why are you doing it that way? And the realization is because nobody's created a better system yet. That can be a great opportunity. So again, two ways. One, start with a solution. The other, start with a problem. I'll note that both of those have flaws. Neither of them are perfect, right? So I tell my students there are some cautionary tales on both sides. You remember the segue, right? But came out 20, 25 years ago. It stands upright and it's going to go revolutionize last mile transportation, but nobody wanted to buy that thing for $5,000, right? It was solving a real problem, but it was the wrong solution for the problem. As far as I can tell, the only use case for a Segway is Paul Blart Mall Cop and those tours around the National Mall, right? (laughs) And on the other side, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could go to your doctor and with one single pinprick, rather than like having to go stop at the lab and have a phlebotomist take a few vials of blood and all that with big needles, you get one pinprick and with one drop of blood, they could test for 150 things. Wouldn't that be amazing? It would. Problem is it doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. We learned that with Theranos. So on either side, you have to watch out for stumbling blocks, but those are still the places that I look. Start with a solution in mind or look for a problem. So Tom, you're executive director of Cornell Center for Regional Economic Advancement. Tell me how you work with people who have business ideas and maybe within the Cornell context as well. The Center for Regional Economic Advancement, or CREA, we're part of the Office of Research and Innovation at Cornell. And I and my colleagues also teach at the SC Johnson College of Business. So we bring a lot of that kind of business aspect of the learning, scholarship, and pedagogy into what we do. And we run a number of programs, but they all have one thing in common, which is that we help people start and grow new businesses. And the fundamental approach that we take behind everything we do is that we look at developing new ventures as a set of assumptions. People make assumptions that can be tested by experiments. So we take this experimentalist view an approach to helping people start new ventures. So a lot of what we do is advising and workshops and 
really poking and prodding at people to say, state your assumptions, right? What are the beliefs that you have about this business idea or this business model? And how can you test those assumptions to make sure that you're heading in the right direction before you take the big leap of creating an entire product only to find out that you created the wrong product or you launched it the wrong way or your customer isn't who you thought they were and you spent a bunch of money marketing to get the attention of people who aren't going to buy what you want to sell them, right? So that if you can test those things ahead of time, you can dramatically increase your chances of success. That's what we're all about. The business idea is just the beginning of a long series of tasks and endeavors that have us hurtling toward developing the actual business idea into a business, making the thing. What are the processes that we can anticipate following this? Just give us a big picture trajectory here. When we work with students, when we work with people in the community and talk about business ideas, first thing we do is we go through the process of thinking about, do you have a product or service in mind or a technology? Do you have a problem that you're looking to solve? So start there, right? Then we go through the process of creating what we call a business thesis, which is just a framework for how you define what a business idea is. From a business thesis, we develop that into a level that we call problem solution fit, which is really more deeply connecting a product or service to the customers that it's trying to serve by looking at it through the lens of what is the job that customer is trying to get done? What is the thing they're trying to accomplish that this product or service can help them with? Once you've established problem solution fit, done some testing around that, then it's around developing an entire business model. So now you've got a customer in mind, you've got value that they might derive from having your solution. Now, how do you find those customers? How do they buy? How do they pay you? What's your revenue model? What resources do you need? What do you have to do? What kind of people do you have in place doing what? What's your cost structure, right? Those are the things that go into an entire business model. And again, getting back to this idea of testing, what it is is just layers of assumptions that are made, each one of which can be stated and tested. So that's the larger picture framework. Let's go back to the business idea itself. How should we vet our business idea or the concept? Obviously, it's not a great idea to pitch to just family members or colleagues, those who are close to you. You've got to get outside of your zone. So how might I do this if I was an entrepreneur in Ithaca, for instance, right? I have a great business idea. Let's talk about that process, how we vet it, who we should vet it through. You bring up a great point, Chris, like, oh, is it good to talk to friends and family about this kind of stuff? I'd say kind of yes, but the sooner you can get past that, as you alluded to, the better off you are. There is a cartoon that one of my colleagues uses in her class that she teaches. I forget who the author is, but it's basically three young men in a room clearly programming something. And one says to the other, oh, if I were a teenage girl, I would love to play this game, right? (laughs) And so those kind of echo chambers are really not that helpful. I mean, I often jokingly say like one smart person talking to another smart person about their opinions about what a third party would do. Just go to the third party, right? Like do not pass go, do not collect $200, right? Get directly to the people that you're talking about. So When we think about vetting a business idea, as we look at it, it's made up of three core parts. One is what's the product or service, a brief description of what it is. The next is who is it for? What's the grouping of customers that you're targeting? And when we say grouping, we mean like a really specific group, not just like all people, right? I make that joke sometimes. Oh, I've got shoes. So who are my customers? Anybody with feet? Well, no, not really, right? I mean, who are the people who actually can derive the value for whatever attributes are of the special shoe that you're making. Maybe it's something that's great for people who do CrossFit. Great. Well, then competitive CrossFitters might be your customer. And then the last part of a business thesis is what does it help them accomplish, right? So what is it? Who is it for? What does it help them accomplish? And once you get those in place, that is a business thesis that articulates a business idea and you start getting some core hypotheses that can be tested. And the next thing to do, get out in front of those customers, go talk to them, Literally go find them and talk to them, right? Go find yourself one of the people who is in that group that you're targeting and ascertain what have they done in the past to solve the problem that you think that they have. That's the first question. What have you ever done to solve this problem or to do this thing? And the answer you might get back is, I've never done anything to solve that problem. Well, that's a pretty good indication that you're barking up the wrong tree and then you can very quickly iterate onto something else before you've spent a bunch of time and money. Okay, you have identified the constituent parts of a business thesis. It should really be, ideally, a one sentence, right? That you're ready to pitch anyone. You never know who you're going to end up in an elevator with, at a party next to. Talk to me about the importance of that. 
Yeah, it couldn't be more important. Good communication skills is not the end all and be all for being an entrepreneur. If you have good communication skills and nothing else, you're not going to get anywhere. I would call it necessary, but not sufficient. There is a lot of academic research, though, that shows that the best entrepreneurs, the most successful ones, have phenomenal communication skills. And so you can't get past it. And this is the first part of it. It's the tip of the iceberg, if you will. You don't get past to the next step if you don't do this part right. So we do spend a lot of time with people in programs, in workshops and advising and so on, trying to refine that business thesis. So a couple parts to it. One is you're always iterating it. And so getting comfortable with the idea that I have a really crisp business thesis now and it may change tomorrow. And that's totally fine. You got to be cool with that, right? There was a joke from Stephen Colbert in the White House Correspondents' Dinner back in 2007, where he said, if then President Bush, who was sitting on the dais, if you recall, he's a man of principle. He believes on Wednesday what he believed on Monday, regardless of what happened on Tuesday. <laughs> right? I love that joke, right? Yeah. And I use it all the time. You don't do that, right? But at whatever it is, you've got your thesis right now that you're pointing at. And you made mention of an elevator, and that's the apocryphal like elevator pitch. But the truth is, you often do have 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds to say, this is who I am and this is what I'm about. And if you can focus in on those three things, what you got in terms of what are you doing, product or service, for whom, who's the customer, and what does it help them do, that gives the recipient of the information enough to click into to say, okay, I'm interested to learn more or not. And that's what it's all about. So Tom, what are the frameworks for validating a business idea? What are the processes involved? There's no single right way to go, first off. This is where you start to get into the combination of art and science. We do talk about, and we really sincerely believe, taking an experimentalist approach. But some of my scholarly colleagues at Cornell might look at how we do experiments and say that's a little bit loose compared to what would lead to a peer-reviewed paper. But something as simple as... If I assume you, Chris, are a member of a customer segment who would value a solution, I'm making a hypothesis. I'm making an assumption there that you have a particular problem or job to be done that you're trying to get done. So as I alluded to before, something as simple as asking you, how have you solved this problem in the past is the really key first step that I always find, to my surprise, a lot of entrepreneurs have a hard time even getting to. And that's a key first step. Getting to your question about frameworks, we use a framework from Alex Osterwalder and his colleagues. It's called the Business Model Canvas. It is a very good strategy framework that we like a lot. Like any framework, it simplifies things. That's what it's there to do. It simplifies and creates categories so that people can understand things better. It means it's not perfect. There is no perfect one, but it's one that we find works quite well for articulating the entirety of a business model, which again is both the delivery of value as well as the capture of value. So it's that third step beyond an idea. Start with an idea, establish problem, solution, fit, then get to a business model. And so we use the business model canvas as a way of articulating the assumptions within a business model. So at this point, are we ready to develop or produce a minimally viable product or am I getting ahead of ourselves? So that's a great phrase. Minimum viable product or MVP is one that gets trotted out all the time in the entrepreneurial community. And it's one where I have a very specific meaning. And so I almost get a little allergic when other people use other meanings for it. So let me elaborate. My engineer friends, my computer science friends in particular, are prone to thinking of an MVP, a minimum viable product, as what I would describe as a technical proof. So I'll see computer science students come to me all the time and say, oh, Professor Scriver, I made an app. And they'll show me the app that they made. And they'll look, you scrolls and the buttons do things when you click on the buttons and the drop downs have drop down text in them and so on. What did they actually prove by creating this app? They didn't prove anything about customer demand. They didn't prove anything about whether or not it does a thing that people cared about. They proved whether or not they could make an app, which is not an insignificant thing for many people, but at Cornell, we have a pretty good computer science department. So I never really doubted that a Cornell computer science student could create an app. So I'm usually in that position of giving them the disappointing news that they didn't actually prove anything that really moved the needle on understanding. So what is a minimum viable product then? It is about demonstrating customer demand. So they're a test of whether or not the solution, the product or service that you're offering 
meets a customer demand and creates value enough to induce that customer to do something about it. So the best phrase that I ever heard about it is that you're guessing what's minimum, the customer is telling you whether or not it's viable. <laughs> That's what a minimum viable product does. And so whenever I hear somebody talk about, oh, I've got an MVP, my first follow-up question is, great, an MVP is a test. What were you testing? Okay, so Tom, through this whole process, many phases through this, how do we deal with setbacks? Whether they come at us early on or even late in the process, which can be even demoralizing. Yeah, I've yet to meet an entrepreneur, successful or otherwise, who didn't have setbacks, right? So that is inherent to the process. And I think number one is my advice to people to say, just find a way to be comfortable with that. You're going to wake up one morning and some unexpected negative thing is going to have happened, right? And that's just the way, unfortunately, it is. There's no way to completely isolate out of that. So the question is, what do you do about it? And within any one of these things is information. That's the key thing is the first thing to do is to say, let me extract the information that I'm gathering. And the information might be that the supplier that I thought would supply me is no longer willing to do so, or the partner is not going to partner, or my marketing strategy to get my customers to be aware of who I am and even show up on my website isn't working as well as I thought. Every one of those things has information in it. It's a question of what you do with that information next. That's the key thing. And so this gets to an entrepreneurial concept that we call a pivot. Pivot, think about basketball, right? You're, you've got one foot planted on the ground. You're moving the rest of your body around an axis. You're changing direction. You're not changing the entire space you're in. You're not moving both feet because that's traveling, right? And I'm pretty sure that's against the rules. You're keeping one foot planted, but you're moving your body around to look for open space where you can go. And so these setbacks, they're never fun, not something anybody enjoys. And I think it's important to kind of sit with that as well. Bad news is bad news, but take the information out of it and then use it to say, okay, so if that door is now closed to me, that's information that I have now about reality that I didn't have before. It was always closed. I just didn't know it. Now I know that it's closed. Where can I look for potentially open doors that I can now go through? Right. So it's a question of using the information to try and design a good pivot. For those of us who don't have the benefit of a Center for Regional Economic Advancement and the expertise and wealth of research and scholarship that's associated with Cornell University, which is most of our audience, are there similar local resources, incubators, hubs for people in the U.S. or even outside of the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. So entrepreneurial community is a really important thing. And there's been a lot of scholarly research that shows that when people operate within a community, it's the old, it takes a village, right? People do far better when they're part of a community than when they operate on their own. And there's a lot of research that backs that up. And very fortunately, it's not just Boston, New York City, Silicon Valley that these communities are operating now. They're all over the country. There's really vibrant startup communities in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and nearby here in Rochester, New York, and of course here in Ithaca. And out in Boise, Idaho, all over the country. And usually there is a kind of center mass or center of gravity for these communities. And very often it is programs that might have a name like a business incubator, business accelerator, or some other startup community. And so if uh, you're listening to this podcast and you're wondering where to look yourself, that's where I would start. I would look in your own town, look for an incubator, look for an accelerator, look for a startup meetup, something like that, chances are there are going to be free events that bring that community together that you can go to and join and start to meet people and then start to benefit from being part of that community. We're at the part of the journey now where we need to prepare to pitch the idea to capital investors to get some money for this thing. How do we approach that? Yeah. So first thing is I find a lot of people making a key mistake. So sorry to start on the negative, but I'll try and steer people away from doing something that's not helpful. Very often I'll see people say, I have an idea. How do I get money to see if my idea is viable? And the answer is you don't. What those people are really asking is they would like someone else to take the risk of whether or not their idea is viable. And from an investor's perspective, that's not really a great trade-off. So what you would find instead is an investor is going to look at it and say, what have you been able to do? cheaply for free to test your core hypotheses and assumptions 
so that the thing that is next to do is something that is more expensive, requires capital, financial resources to go to the next step. And so what I would do as an entrepreneur is really think hard about all of the assumptions that underlie the business idea, problem solution fit, the business model. What are all the things that you can do to test whether or not your customers are who you think they are, that you can find them, that they have the problem or job to be done that you think that they do, that they're motivated to actually get that job done, that they have the resources to pay for a solution, that your partners are willing to partner with you, that you can acquire the resources and so on. And this is really a planning activity. And the way we look at that planning activity is foundationally based on stating assumptions or hypotheses and then testing them experimentally so that by the time you get out to ask an investor for money, you have gone and answered all the questions that you can answer cheaply or for free so that their next step of what they are funding and the value that can be created with their funding is more clear because that's what's in it for them, right? You want their money to create value. They want to put money into things that create value. You can do the planning, run these experiments to make sure that you're articulating a plan to do exactly that. Tom Scriver, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today and helping us work through what makes a good business idea and how to make it happen. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the episode notes for more information on Cornell's online startup funding and finance certificate program which happens to have been authored by our guest, Tom Scriver. So thank you for listening to the Keynotes podcast, and we'll see you next time.